of the funding, in mind there may be more that we haven't even thought about. And then uh, we'll also be just thinking about what gets funded or who gets funded. So uh, the type of people that get funded, the type of issues that get funded, the type of groups that get funded, um, and also the funding process. So what's required to get the money? You know, what sort of skills do you need? What sort of training? Even if you're just asking for money, if you've done grassroots fundraising, you know, sometimes you've got to get a little boost on how to ask your friends for money, because that can be very hard. Uh, uh, but it's just up to grant writing. And then kind of that, that, uh, what it takes in terms of reporting, being able to evaluate all the requirements that may or may not come from the money that you get. So, so that's just to keep in mind that we uh, do this panel, uh, our plenary. I don't know, what is this? Yeah. Um, and we have uh, four amazing uh, people who are going to talk today. I'm just going to do them, say them in alphabetical order, and then I'm going to ask them each a question, and then we'll start opening it up to other people. So, uh, San Sangeeta Gujaraja, Gujaraja, who um, is the director of programs for the uh, Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice, is also, I would say all of these people have done activist work in their paid and unpaid time, so uh, I'm not going to go through their wonderful bios that are in your program. Uh, but she's, I think what's important to know, she's done work both in the U.S., but she's also done transnational work in funding. And that's, Raise your hand because people might not know who you are. Trisha Deb here works, uh, has been a LGBT funder and now works for Caring Across Generations. And I'm going to read what it is. It's a campaign bringing together home care workers, consumers, and families to protect all people's rights to choose the care and support they need to live with dignity. Then there's Mara Kiesling, who's over there at the end, who's the founding executive director of the National Center for Transgender Equality and that started in 2003. And then we have Ben Francisco Malbec, who's the president of the LGBT, or LGBT, maybe not C, LGBTQ, okay, you know, it was different places that said different things, uh, uh, which is a network of foundations <laughs> and other donors committed to increasing equality and well-being for the LGBT community. So um, we tried to set it up here, we got rid of that podium, we're very happy. Uh, and so I want to start with uh, Ben, I think maybe you could start us off because what Ben has, he wants to talk the facts and figures. So maybe you can give us some context in terms of LGBT numbers. So uh, yeah, I guess I get to be the numbers guy, uh, so that we're all, you know, numbers are fun for some of us. Um, and I will mostly, you know, my lens, because we are a network of mostly foundations, I will focus on that, but I'll try to put that in context so that we're not just talking about that, because actually one of the challenges is, despite my role, I think sometimes we are too focused on the foundation piece, uh, even though it's, that's an important piece. Um, so in terms of total foundation funding for LGBTQ issues, uh, that's about 125 million annually total. Um, so the, the good news about that number is that it's gone way up really quickly. Um, it was $30 million just 10 years ago, so it's quadrupled uh, in a decade. So I think, that's, I think that's a good thing, it's growing fast. On the other hand, uh, as Francis alluded to, that's still, that's still pretty small. That is 0.25% of the $50 billion uh, that foundations give out for anything at all. Um, and you know, we see similar trends when we look at other underserved communities, uh, you know, APIs, Latinos, African Americans, all, each of those communities see, receives 1% or less of foundation dollars, um, and are far more than 1% of the population. Um, so there's a general trend of actually, the organized philanthropy is not responding well to underserved communities. Um, so, so part of one of my key messages is, you know, I think we spend a lot of time thinking about that $125 million that goes, you know, from funders we know uh, to LGBT communities. It's very visible to us, but I think it's very important that we also look at that larger $50 billion uh, and think about, uh, you know, advocating and making sure that more of those resources are reaching, relevant to queer communities, communities of color, uh, women, even women are underfunded despite being, you know, more than 50% of the population, um, you know, looking at that bigger picture. The other bigger picture, uh, again, for what Francis was saying, is that foundation dollars themselves are only about 15% of all philanthropic giving. Uh, corporations are even smaller at only 5%, um, and then the bulk, about 80%, is from individual donors. So that's really where 
uh, you know, where the big resources are actually is directly from individual donors, not from foundations. Um, the other thing is, uh, uh, again, building on what Francis is saying, uh, the 50 billion of all foundations really pales in comparison to the trillions uh, that come from government, at least when our government uh, is able to operate. Uh, so, uh, and I really actually, when I think about where did the nonprofit industrial complex come from, I, my own thesis is that the architect is Ronald Reagan. Uh, because in the 1980s, uh, he decided, let's start outsourcing, you know, let's start outsourcing government services uh, to non-profit organizations for contract. And I, I, my belief is that there was a three-part plan uh, to sort of uh, dismantle uh, the New Deal and you know a whole set of the, the social safety net that we have in our country. Um, and it started with outsourcing to nonprofits, and then uh, lowering taxes or revenue so as to starve the beast, um, and then finally eliminating entirely. Uh, with this dual justification of, oh, it's outsourced, so it's not even really a government function, and, oh, and we don't have the revenue to pay for it. Um, and I think that's been a very intentional three-part plan, and we're now in that phase three of, let's eliminate as many services uh, that the government provides uh, in its entirety. Um, that's just my personal thesis about how this all happened. Um, so, and, and then I'll just look a little bit, how many do we have? Okay, one more minute. Okay, so just to look a little bit more about the 125 million of LGBTQ issues, um, and so sort of how is it working for the most underserved within our communities? About $5 million uh, in 2011 went for transgender communities, uh, so that's a pretty small fraction, though it is going in a good direction because a few years ago it was less than a million. So from less than a million to five million is a good trajectory. Um, and uh, for queer communities of color, we see about 14 million, um, which also has been going up. It was less than six million uh, just a few years ago. So, and in general, I would say the note I'll end on is that uh, I actually think, especially among LGBTQ funders, there is a lot of interest in supporting a, a sort of work with a social justice lens and it's more intersectional. Um, and, but even when that interest is there, there are a lot of structural obstacles that make that hard to actually implement, um, which maybe is something we can get into as the panel goes on. <coughs> Okay, so we'll go back to those structural obstacles. Uh, you know, uh, we got the oh, big overview. You've been raising money for your organization for 10 years, and uh, it would be good if you talked about kind of how you saw the landscape, but also kind of what your vision was and how funding has influenced your vision, if it has. Sure, thank you very much. Um, I, you know, I think I can really pretty honestly say that fundraising has not in any way impacted my vision or MCP's vision. Um, I, uh, we, we are a very weird organization in a lot of ways, and we, we're constantly struggling and talking about whether or not the model that we've chosen, which I don't even think there's a name for, really works. Um, it's worked so far, and it's worked so far really, really, really well. Um, but I, you, you may notice I didn't raise my hand as an executive director when you asked, who's are you the main person who raises the money in your organization? Not, or whatever you said, I am. It's not the main part of my job. It will never be the main part of my job. Nobody at MCP will ever be the main part of their job being raising money. That's not true. We are going to hire development directors. But it, won't be, it, won't be, it won't be me. We, <laughs> well, honestly, that's, that's just not why I'm, I'm in it. Um, and MCP is not in it so that we can grow. MCP is not in it so that we can be big. We're in it to do the work. We're in it to get great people who are doing really great work. Um, it's work we really believe in. And, and let me just tell you my, where my point of view comes from, because it's, it, it's important. It's just from a very small part of the LGBT movement. We're a national organization. We're a policy advocacy organization. So we, we're not a grassroots organization. Um, about 80% of our funding comes from foundations. Um, we raise about $105,000 a year. Our, our budget this year is about 700. About 105 of that will come from individual donors. Um, we have never had a check from a non-foundation for more than $10,000, and we only had two of those checks. Um, so most of our checks are, are much, much, much less than that, which is weird for a national policy organization. Um, about $60,000 of our money last year, and it'll probably be about the same this year, came from me doing college speaking. 
Um, that's another source of income that we haven't we haven't talked about, but, but that's a really important part of, of NCPE's um, budget. Uh, and it's the only people we charge for speaking. Um, we, we don't really do any corporate speaking. I guess we would probably charge them too. Um, I mean, I do actually. I was with Clara at Pride this June, and we we were paid for speaking engagement there. Um, but for the most part, uh, that that's where our money comes from. And whereas about five years ago we were the largest transgender organization in the country, I think we're fourth or fifth now. Um, other organizations have grown, 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 and we've just slowly grown um, in, in a very systematic way. And I, I, two things I, I want to say about foundations. Um, we have never at NCPE, and I, I mean this, never made a decision based on funding. We just, we just simply do not do it. it. Our board doesn't allow it. The staff wouldn't allow it. Um, if we're working on immigration, it's because we're working on immigration, and then we go find money. And um, it, it, uh, a weird thing about NCPE, I think this will be shocking to most people. I don't know, in, in 10 years, if we had, well, eight years, because our first two years, we wouldn't take money from foundations. We wanted to see if we could raise $100,000 from trans people first. So we did that. We started taking foundation money. And I don't know, let's say we've, made, we've had 50 grants since then. Uh, I'm making that number up, but it's about right. Uh, of those 50 grants, 48 of them have been for general operating support. We generally do not take, we, we generally, I, I think we would, we do take money. Like if somebody said, we well, do money for immigration, we're working hard on immigration right now, so we absolutely take money that was designated for immigration. But, but the big LGBT foundations are funding us with general operating support, and not once has anybody ever said, don't work on that, do work on this, which I guess means they appreciate what we're doing. It is possible that they feel like they have to be funding some national trans organization, and we get a lot of leeway that way. Um, but we've never been told what to do by one of the big LGBT foundations. We just simply never have been. Um, and it could just be that we're doing what they want us to do anyway. Um, so that, that may be part of it. A couple of things I just want to flag and then I'll stop. The money, the, 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 the money is starting to come in on trans stuff. It seems to be coming in more and more to larger groups. And, and a lot of the groups are growing and growing, or we're growing. Um, and I think that's important. But another part of what's happening that is really starting to weigh us down quite a bit is, uh, is big foundations are giving money to other people to do trans work, mm. and they're writing us into it, not, they're not writing us into the budget, they're writing us into an advisory role, and so we find ourselves having to advise this group and advise that group. Um, a, a big, big part of our agenda now is somebody else's agenda. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, recently somebody gave several hundred thousand dollars to another organization to do messaging on trans issues. And we're supposed to go to all of the focus groups, and we're supposed to review all the reports. And our the quandary that puts us in is, do we just say, fuck you, no, and let non-trans people do the trans messaging, or do we pitch in? Now, I, I should say the Ford Foundation just actually stepped up and is now paying us to consult with a huge project they gave to somebody else. But, but I, I think that's a, a, a troubling trend. Another troubling trend is, the trans movement is now really starting to work towards what I, I will call the gay model of fundraising, um, which I will unfortunately call cocktails, hooks up, hookups, and making people feel important. <laughs> and, um, I, you know, there is a place, there is a place for that. Um, <laughs> More and more trans groups are doing that. They are basing everything on, you know, having a corporate advisory board and having a gala and having, and, and I think that's a trend we have to watch. Another trend I'm really nervous about is government funding. Um, we now have significant influence in the federal government. We collectively um, have significant influence, and we're starting to see couple million dollars here for a center on, on LGBT aging. 
okay, I think it's a fine center, I'm not picking on the center. But then, then uh, $15 million to study LGBT homelessness in Los Angeles, and, and, and that does change the nature of things, and it changes the nature of who can get money, and we have to watch that. And then the last thing I just want to flag is referendums. Um, we're now staring down the barrel of two possible huge referendums that in trans world, we can't even imagine how to fund. And honestly, I'm afraid we're going to figure out how to fund them. Um, and I think we, we as a community have to have a talk about that. Uh, one is uh, AB 1266, the bill in California that um, allows uh, students to access all the programs in their school. It's being framed as teenage boys get to pick which locker room they use. If it goes to referendum, which the National <coughs> Organization for Marriage is threatening, and we don't know yet that it will, it could be a $10 million endeavor to lose. We, we might win. We might put $5 million in and win, or we might put $10 million in and lose. I have no idea where that kind of fucking money comes from. Um, but I think there ought to be a rational conversation, and there will be, about whether or not that is a good thing. Um, and, and I know that's, for some people, they're like, of course it's not a good thing. And other people are like, well, of course it's a good thing. We can't lose that. But I'll tell you, if we're going to lose that, which I don't know that we would, but I think we would, um, I don't want to lose it for $10 million that, that will be taken away from somewhere. It is $10 million that will be somewhere. Um, so I'm going to stop there. Those are just some things that are, I'm thinking about. It. Crisis that there's not enough funding that even though it's growing going to LGBT issues, we have the crisis of what the money does, where the money comes from, and what we do to get the money. Um, so, Krishala, you've been a funder. You do grassroots organizing. If you had to describe the crisis, especially its impact on the grassroots, what would you highlight? Three days of civil disobedience at um, the federal 
um, kind of immigration office here at, in New York City where over 70 people got arrested. We organized a citywide coalition of people of color um, called Third World Within. And what part of our assertion through that work was that the war, there was a war abroad and a war at home, and those wars were connected. Uh, we did a lot of work around know your rights work and detention with LGBTSC immigrants. Um, and um, we talked about the myth of that, that what that political moment revealed was the myth of democracy in this country, the myth of citizenship, and the myth of a national economy. So we did a lot of work to really kind of understand our role as um, working class and poor LGBTSC people of color in the United States. Um, and, and I think the, mo the reason that it's important to name that is because I'm not sure what that work accomplished. Um, and that's a very kind of heavy lesson. I think that's a part of, at the heart of, of some of this discussion. I think making a left pole within a broader LGBT movement building uh, framework is very important. But it's not the same as a mass position. It's not the same as a mass movement. And um, it really <coughs> comes with its risks. Um, the other kind of beautiful lesson that I think came out of that period was I and some other people developed an understanding that our experience as LGBT people had the potential to save the world. Because there was a moment of real disillusionment after 9-11 that was like, the, you know, that it felt like the power of the state was so big that it kind of covered everything. It was like a moment of awakening that mass movements had very limited power to impact political reality in this country. But we already knew that. And part of what we know as LGBT people is that claiming our full humanity within that kind of blind authority mm. is the only mm. way forward. Mm. And so there was kind of, there's also some really beautiful moments of clarity <coughs> around where our power lay. Mm. And I think that's very much also at the heart of this discussion. So then after I worked at AOP, um, I was invited to work uh, at the Arcus Foundation um, in the national program. And I thought maybe that was Urbishi, like punking the foundation. <laughs> but actually, it was you punking me. And I might say It does not need a mass. It does not need 
millions of people doing the same thing because it operates on passing policies in a very searchable and effective way. And that's utilizing um, research, lawyers, lobbyists, and communication staff. Um, and then the third hard question and tension for us to grapple with is that for people doing grassroots organizing, we are not attempting to organize a mass movement. None of us are figuring out how to have 50,000 members in our organization, or 100,000, or 200,000. And, and part of that is because one of the lessons I learned at ALP is that organizing people who are struggling to survive and people who are in pain is the hardest work there is. It's the hardest work there is. And it's not really possible to do that on a scale of 50,000 people and 100,000 people. And we haven't really figured out kind of what the infrastructure looks like that takes us from there, from you know, yeah. really deep bases of maybe hundreds of people to uh, the ability to move millions of people in the same political direction. There's no sector to this infrastructure that is trying to figure that out. So I'm just going to stop there. But those are just questions. Yeah, right. talk about funding. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, one of the things that Australia has really concentrated on, and we, we recently did a report about a, a very um, grandiose title about the future of the LGBT movement, which you can pick up by Maureen on your way out if you want to do the very fast and get copies. Um, and people talked about uh, the fact that the movement needed more uh, people of color and people of color-led organizations. And Australia really has been on the forefront of developing that. Uh, so maybe you could talk about what's happened with that, how that got developed, and what's the future, but also what's the pipeline to bring in more smaller organizations. Yeah, thanks. Um, so the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice has been uh, funding LGBTQI organizations both in the U.S. and around the world for 36 years in the U.S. and 17 internationally. Um, and Catherine Nancy, who is our former founding executive director in the room, so if I say any name, that's incorrect. I'm sure she'll stand up and call me that bullshit. <laughs> um, so in 2005, Australia started its first movement building initiative. And it was a kind of funding, actually, that Australia had never seen before. It was a $3 million grant from the Ford Foundation. And it allowed us to make multi-year commitments at the largest size we had ever made to, at the end of the five-year initiative, to 14 organizations um, who we then uh, supported, again, multi-year and brought, got to bring together actually over five times over the course of, of that year, over those years. And they, um, through that time, formed the first queer, trans, people of color-led national coalition um, in this country. And three years ago, that funding stopped. Right? So those organizations, many of them, um, Australia was one of their first funders. These were the largest grants they had ever gotten. They actually built their capacity in ways they had never been able to build it before in terms of infrastructure. It was flexible funding. It was uh, funding that could be used for base building, for organizing, for local organizing. It didn't have to be a national campaign necessarily. It was really driven by the needs of the community and of the groups themselves. Um, but Australia was in a really incredible position to be able to resource that work. And, you know, the, the crisis that happened about three years ago in terms of that funding not being available is, is really impacting those groups. So it's been about two years actually that Australia has been um, asking a lot of questions about what do we do next? Who are, who are we? How can we continue to advocate for these groups? What does it actually mean? Where's the funding going to come from? Um, what are what are the mechanisms and, and creative and innovative things that we can put in place in order to make that happen? And at the same time, the money isn't flowing, right? So what is it? What is it? What is it doing to these organizations over a period of time? Um, and we've seen some of those organizations actually be wildly successful, right? And that and that actually depends some more on what you were talking about. Do you actually um, have? Uh, conversations about funder-driven strategy. Is it, or do you stick to the, the values that you originally intended and continue to do the work that's most important, right? So um, it's been a really interesting moment for, for Australia to think about our role in philanthropic advocacy and to begin to have those conversations 
um, within philanthropy. So one of the things that I think about a lot of all of us as movement folks, having thought about what it meant to build a movement of LGBTQI people in this country, to think about replicating that model within philanthropy as well. And so what we're seeing is, um, we're asking the questions about how has case making changed? And if, it's, if case making has actually changed, what are we doing on the philanthropic side to meet that? And are we changing the case within, within our own conversation so that we can continue to advocate for these groups? Um, and, and I think the future depends on public foundations, really, who are, who have been in deep relationship and dialogue with these groups to continue to have this conversation and, and figure out how do we support the emerging groups. You know, two years ago, we were, many of us, in this room, actually, we're at a gathering um, in Minneapolis called the Bold Gathering, and at the end of that, I think it was you, Trishala, that asked the question um, to, to the group, how many groups in this room are uh, staff of less than five, or volunteer-led, or a uh, budget of less than 50,000, and I think half the room stood up, right? And that was two years ago, and I think Australia really has been thinking about how do we continue our legacy of supporting those groups when the funding infrastructure has shifted so significantly. And what we're seeing, and, and um, I just heard about this new report that the Association of Women in Development is, is writing, and they, they had written a report years ago called Where's the Money for Women's Rights? And right now they're writing one that's, that's really about how the, the current philanthropic infrastructure is just watering the leaves and starting the roots. And that's really what, what we're seeing right now, I think, in this, in this environment. And so I'm really interested in having this conversation with all of you. So uh, before I, I wanted to open it up for a minute to the audience and we'll go back to questions, but does anybody want to have a comment on anything they've heard here? Just, and I just want to give the panel a chance to respond to each other. I just, I, I thought, um, I, I really appreciate all the other comments in, in response to what Mr. Michelle was saying. I, really, I, love, I love categorization, so I'm a J on Myers-Briggs, but I think we can always feel good to announce that as panel. <laughs> um, so, uh, I really like your four subsectors, um, and I think that there's a couple of trends that I've noticed that are important to be aware of. One is, in philanthropy in general, uh, it is, meaning like the whole $50 billion of all foundation giving, it tends to be services that are more funded, right? And actually, the LGBT, our little sub-piece, the LGBT sector, is a little bit different from that. Um, and act, and which I think is something good uh, about LGBT funders. They are very into and get the value of advocacy. Um, and I would actually say of those four sectors you named, the federal policy and state policy stuff, as well as the services are all, I mean, none of them are well funded, but relatively they get more resources. And it really is the grassroots strategy uh, that for various reasons is not getting more funding. And part of it is uh, the bias against the small. Uh, grant support and the bias for the 501c3 uh, structure that we've been talking about these past two days. Um, some of which is even, you know, if you, if you are a program officer at a foundation, you know, the prospect of funding, if you want to give a grant to a $50,000 uh, or $10,000, uh, you know, transgender POC organization, that is a really hard sell internally. It's really hard to make the case, uh, just because there are such strong structural biases against this. Um, so, yeah, that's my comment. So, I wanted to spend just one minute to see if there are comments, and I, I have lots of questions to ask, but I wanted to take a pause and just see from what people have said so far, are there some burning questions that people, or non burning questions that people want to start with? Otherwise, I cannot ask more questions. So, we'll just take a, a minute to see. My name is Jason Lyon, and I work with Black and Pink. Uh, and actually, going right to the comment that I've just made, I'm actually noticing it's really difficult for us to get any funding for service work that's actually really important to advocacy and organizing, um, and that our analyses of organizing for funders, for radical funders, can actually be wildly limited in terms of our needs of serving currently and formerly incarcerated folks, where service is an essential part of organizing. That if we can't do court accompaniment, if we can't do uh, like money to get people tea fair, that's our subway, uh, or can't get people just to, you know, support around housing and things like that, that there is no organizing. Um, and how do we, how do funders 
um, understand that differently because we would love to be able to, like for us we just want to give our money also to our membership so that they can have the things that they need. I think it speaks up to your point, Deshaun. Do you want to have any comments here? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I think that um, because, because as Ben has said and, and other people have said, the kind of, the base of who are funders in the LGBT sector is pretty narrow. You know, it's, it's like it's a very specific number of foundations that are primarily private funders. Um, what it means is that there's like, there's a very specific political agenda, which has basically been marriage, non-discrimination, and the DOMA, it was DOMA, D-A-D-T, um, that, that are kind of basically in, like progress towards that agenda is what is getting implemented. And so everything concerning kind of like there, there's kind of not a role for the political reality of um, of kind of everything else outside of that framework right now. And I think our job is is actually to make a case of for what what is the political reality that we want to create in which those material um, realities matter, right? Um, which is to say. What's the kind of, I, I think that now that we're kind of at a moment around progress on the equality agenda that's happened, it's, we can start making a case for what's next. And I think part of what that is, is some reckoning with the reality that the majority of LGBT people, of LGBTSP people in this country are living in poverty, are shut out of the economy, and um, are kind of dealing with the financial crisis in the deepest way. And so I, I think it's about actually changing the political framework for the, the entire sector, um, but that takes time. And so the, the short answer to your question is that I don't think that there is a function for organizing poor people in the current political paradigm. Uh, you know what? You're not alone. They're just, they're, it, it's so common in communities of color, and especially in queer communities of color, that we don't, you know, we don't sit down and say, uh, let's start a service nonprofit, or let's start, a, you know, a advocacy organization to do these. You know, it's, it's, it's basically we come together as communities and say, let's do stuff together to mutually support each other to get stuff done. Whether that is, you know, marching. Or you know, or helping each other out with the laundry, like it's it's all it's all mixed up, right? Uh, whereas funders work in silos, and I think the, the the hard thing is there are you know the, the service funders are scared because what you do is too political, and then there is a certain set of, of uh, more progressive and left funders who have a very uh, rigid definition of organizing. Yeah. Um, and I think we really need to articulate and push back and constantly say, you know, organizing is not just, uh, you know, the Saul Alinsky model of organizing, as, as cool as that is. Uh, it's also, you know, it's, organizing is anytime we come together as a community to take care of each other and to, to change the world around us. Um, and I think that's just a message, like, we should all get out there and push as hard as we can, because that, that siloing is one of the things that has most hurt us. Hi, um, I'm J.D., Julie Davis from the HIV Prevention Justice Alliance. I have a burning question and a quick burning observation. Um, so my burning question is for Ben and anyone else, which is um, if you look at the history of uh, AIDS, HIV AIDS funding, so there's, there's resources there, both sort of di distinct and numbers-based potentially, and also diffuse, right, about what, how this has bolstered and or shaped LGBTQ movements, organizing services, leadership development, etc. So I see some siloing um, that um, I'd like to, you know, where do we go to calculate that in um, and then into our analysis. And then as, as sort of an observation over to the last few days is that it seems like in the system or systems of uh, power and funding that there, there's uh, in some times, in some ways, tolerance for like one countercultural project that gets funded, right? But it, it, there's not going to be a thousand Sylvia, Sylvia Bear Law project in each town. There's the one that, uh, I don't know how it all works, but I would assume it's sort of, oh, we, we do that, check, right? Um, so I, I feel a tension as we speak, or even learn about incredible work, and in some cases, I am so happy that these incredible programs get to be the one, right? 
but it sets maybe the standard that we go out in a system that's going to say, oh, no, we've already got that one. Don't, don't replicate it. No, don't learn from it. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm very, I'm very worried about uh, the HIV infrastructure, uh, which is really, you know, when you look at any, 90%, I'm making up a statistic, but it's probably mostly right. 90% of queer uh, uh, POC organizations with budgets of more than half a million are, uh, get their money from HIV, Brian White stuff. And that's probably going to either go away or be really cut in the next five years in this horrible austerity. Every six months we debate shutting down the government and not paying the, you know, it's, it's hard to see us really being able to save those dollars. Um, so I think that there is uh, a huge shift that I, I, I really, I'd like to see funders and leaders really think about how, how do we prepare our, uh, that infrastructure to make the transition. There's some creative things happening where some uh, HIV service organizations have gotten, you know, FQH, federally qualified health uh, center status and are looking at getting funds from Affordable Care Act which I think has to happen just to sustain those really basic uh, need services that they provide. Um, I also think there is a really hot possibility of uh, looking at, you know, shifting to, having a really win-win, let's have a big tent on LGBT queer wellness uh, as something where we can bring in, you know, HIV funders, LGBT resources, and bigger health, you know, I really would see some of the big, love to see some of the bigger health funders uh, looking at the health disparities that LGBTQ communities face, which largely have not been addressed by the mainstream health uh, funding infrastructure world. So I, I wanted to follow up in a, a little bit of a different way, tying in that question with uh, some of the comments that people have made, which is, you know, we exist within this, this political economy, and uh, many of the uh, panels and plenaries have talked about that. <coughs> And, uh, and also, in the other panels we've had on funding and fundraising, there's not a pure funding source. Like, wh who are the right funders? You know, it, and even I really appreciate it, people saying even membership funding has some of its challenges and issues. So I, I wanted to ask you, like, where, where do you feel like the money should come from, and how, is, how would we start shifting this kind of political economy? We're in the political economy. We're not outside of it. So how, uh, how do we start shifting some of that? <coughs> Sure. I, I think for me the question is about who should fund it. It's, it's um, why and how uh -huh. we can fund LGBTQI issues and, and general um, progressive social justice infrastructure. And I think, you know, it, we, we've been asking that question, I think, a lot. Uh, and there have been, even yesterday in a conversation around democracy and philanthropy, there was this whole conversation about what what money is clean and what money is dirty and how does that move, move through and are, are we washing it off on, on the way out the door, right? So I think those, those conversations are, are real. And at the same time, I think there are, uh, are creative ways to, to think about this. So from, from Australia's perspective on the international front, we've actually entered into um, our first ever partnership with, with the U.S. federal government, USAID, on the international side. And you know, I can't say that that was not without its really significant both internal and external political challenges, right? Um, and thinking about our role actually in, in as an advocate, as, as, a, um, as a funder and, and as part of a, a larger community, thinking about how we actually do act as a buffer and is that possible. Um, to and it's not about again it's not about cleaning up the money but how do we how do we negotiate the systems that are in place how do we negotiate conditionalities and actually not sign on to the ones that would that would interfere with our values and continue to move forward with the work and act as a as a buffer um, for the grantees so that they're actually not dealing with the bullshit of USAID right so what does that actually mean and and sh should it foundations actually take that role on. And so I think we've been asking a very different set of questions about what that actually means. Um, and so, again, I think it's, I think the key is, is really about an abundance of perspectives and, and thinking about how we engage in those, in those conversations in meaningful ways. So again, my experience is all in a more national organization context. And, you know, one of the, things I think we all, as people who care about things, have to be honest about is whether or not our vision 
whether or not our work is effective and useful. I mean, useful, I think, is a better word. Um, you know, we as a policy advocacy organization have ways we measure our effectiveness, and we are still feeling like we're being effective and useful. But you know, I I, I know in the you know the disability rights movement right now, um, the women's rights movement. I mean, these be all these all movements we know are a mess. Um, they're all having funding issues. They're all they all have imbalances of power. They all have a lot more money flowing to the big, less effective organizations, which may or may not be effective in the way they want to measure it. Um, you know, the, the you know that sounds like a perfectly wonderful use of the government, um, and 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 that's really great. And I don't I don't mean to demean organizations that take money from the government at all. The problem is when you become reliant on the government money. Um, you know, most of the disability rights movement, most of the visible staff, money, disability rights movement now seems to be fighting to keep their job training programs money from the federal government or to raise money that's watered down, money to, for research that's watered down because of their administrative costs and all that. And, and, and I think there, there's no, the, the frustrating for me, thing for me as a national organization leader in the LGBT movement is there is absolutely no accountability um, except when it's way too late. You know, if, if I was in charge of the world, which I shouldn't be, but if I was in charge of the movement, there are five or six organizations that I would just say, come on, is that really a useful way to be spending our collective resources? Um, I've instituted a new rule in my own head, which nobody is buying into, but <laughs> I think once an executive director leaves an organization, there should be some mechanism for the, because then you've lost the person who has the most need to keep the organization going. Not just because of their own salary, but because they've been really worried about everybody else's salary and keeping their staff together. But I think there should be a, a way at that point where we collectively say, yeah, you know what, we don't need the National Center for Transgender Equality. Let's take their stuff and put it over here. Or, um, and there, that doesn't happen. Instead, everybody on the boards, everybody on the staff convinces themselves that this is really a useful endeavor. And it just isn't always. And I think we should figure out how to be honest about that. Yeah, I I wanted just to note that I think that um, part of what I'm seeing um, some of my colleagues do in the grassroots sector is kind of adapting in, in some really wonderful ways to a new political moment. And I think one, one thing that I've seen is um, organizations really kind of answering the question of who is we differently, right? So um, we can be all people in New York City that are impacted by police violence. Um, we can be um, everyone who is really looking at the change in the national health care system um, and what opportunities it offers and what things it threatens in a different way. We is um, all people who are aging, um, including people who are HIV positive, and are looking at a completely different social safety net. So I think that um, that the that's called, in the foundation world, world it's called alliance building. <laughs> but um, I think it's deeper than what is called coalition building, right? I think it's like, it's really, it's thinking of who we are um, in relationship to each other in, in a much different way. And part of what I'm also seeing, I think that's really great, is actually, in some places, the grassroots and service sectors kind of realigning after a period of, of not seeing each other as the um, and I think that's absolutely crucial. And then the, the other opportunity um, that I think is in front of us is, is really around base building. That um, actually um, we, we do need to be um, kind of creating infrastructures in which uh, people can start participating again in the political system, especially people who are most marginalized by that system. And um, I think that the, the government shutdown is kind of an amazing opportunity to, to look at um, kind of at the political moment we're in in this country where the question that's on the table is not 
how much public services are funded, but if there are going to be public services. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think that that it's an amazing opportunity for um, for base building and coalition building in, in a really different way. Um, and it might be kind of the next step in in this question of how of how we explain our political <coughs> value in, in this system in this moment. So um, what I'm going to do is take a series of questions, take three or four minutes to put the hands up. My question is about regionalism, regional inflections for this. Um, the New York Times on Saturday had an article, Millions of Poor Are Left Uncovered by Health Law. Um, because they live in, and if we're, if we're concerned, genuinely, as Trishal has opened up about the poor and mass movements, um, where are the poor and what's happening to those people? Places. Um, because they live in states largely controlled by the Republicans that have declined to participate in vast expansions of Medicare, the medical insurance program for the poor, they are among the 8 million Americans who are in college. The 26 states that have rejected Medicare expansion are home to about half of the country's population. There are about 68% of the poor, uninsured blacks, and single mothers. About 60% of the country's uninsured working poor are those in those states among those excluded, et cetera. And when you look at the states, it's really the Confederacy of Texas. You know, so, um, so what's the, if you want a mass-based social justice movement that deals from the bottom up with poor immigrants, people of color, um, then how do we organize nationally <coughs> and why, and these, these counties, or these states are also the ones that have been gerrymandered so that he found people who live in ashes must destroy the state for every for poor people are also there too. The people who have the most needs and the people at the top who are also the most in control and ready to break the whole economy of the world are coming to St. Vincent. So strategically, like how do we as LGBTQ people think about that? Sarah Sheldon, thank you for your insights. Hi, my question is about international funding. What are the new trends, priorities, and agendas for international funding? And what happens when we, in the West, change our minds about what the agendas are, and how does that affect groups that, that are now being, having reduced funding? Uh, my name is Rebecca, um, and I just want to be like critically worried for a second about the idea that the way forward for a lot of queer orgs uh, can be health funding. Um, I really understand the need for money. Uh, I also think there are a lot of possible examples, but the one I want to personally bring um, as a fat activist is that this is a strategy a lot of queer organizations have been doing recently is they're taking large grants for um, handling what they see as the problem of lesbian obesity. Um, and this isn't money that's going to things like training doctors about how to um, how to manually search for tumors and fat bodies. It's not money that's going to larger CAT scans. It's not money that's creating accessibility. It's money that's creating more programs so that when I go into the doctor that I'm given a long lecture about how I need to lose weight or else they won't even look at any of the th reasons that I'm going to the doctor, right? That, um, that, it's, that, that, <laughs> thank you, that it's not, that it has no connection to actually why my understanding of health, that it's only about policing. Um, and so I just want to think about if our understandings of health, and this is much broader than just fat, um, if queer understandings of health are compatible with uh, who the funders are for health funding. Great. I'm here. Um, I just wanted to sort of jump on the black and pink friend um, who was talking about how we do this space building work and remind us of the legacies that have been built before us before some of these funding structures came into be like uh, Young Women's Empowerment Project really looked at the Black Panther Party and how the Black Panther Party did organizing work and sustain people and we recreate membership has benefits, right? Like we we created membership benefit packages and I just I want us to think about um, all of these ways that our base sales go to bail funds but also go to bus cards um, as a it's as though funders don't exist because they will actually not give us that money. So I think like, I love what Trishala was saying about changing that dynamic and given that that's long term, let's mine the transformative justice resources of our ancestors and the people who worked really hard before us, uh, especially the Black Panther Party who really, I mean, nailed it. Um, 
on many levels, but that one especially. So, um, yeah, it's, it's less of a question, but more just about how we, w in, instead of funders saying no, how funders can partner with us to do that um, more effectively. Okay, we have four questions, and we'll go on this side. Um, we have the question about uh, poverty and regionalism and the rise of the Confederacy and deny uh, services to low-income people and people of color and women, uh, international funding and the way it, it changes and what that happens, uh, um, the issue of health funding uh, and how it directs us and, and uh, guides us and instead of our writing that and then kind of uh, how we use our money, raise money. And money. <laughs> so I can address the international funding question, and also um, I wanted to talk a little bit about lived experience and lived realities as, as the driving factor around, around funding. Um, so internationally, the trends are definitely that we're seeing a, a market increase in bilateral funding, which is government funding to LGBTQ issues. So that includes, obviously, the, the U.S., which is a $3.5 million investment over four years. Um, we're seeing similar investments from the European Union, from the Netherlands, Norway, Sweden, um, and others. And so I think the key really around that to really think about how how we meet the shift when eventually it will likely happen, right, is to ensure the sustainability of this work. And so it adds another layer, actually, if, if we're seeing this trend, it adds another layer to philanthropy to actually increase the resources to that work. And so we're actually part of a consortium called the Global Philanthropy Project, which is some of the largest um, LGBTQI funders internationally who are trying to address this need actually on the front end to increase the resources to the field from, from now so that when, when the tide changes, we'll be ready to meet that. So, but there is definitely um, increased resources, I think, in a way that we actually haven't seen nationally. So that's definitely true. Um, and I think around the question about how are we organizing movement-wide to think about how we're engaging different sectors of funding, health sectors included, I think one of the things that we've really been thinking about and what the Straight Up Movement Building Initiative actually did was took its cue from the field, right? So what were the lived experiences and lived realities of our communities and how could they then, how, what was our role in actually translating that into a fundraising environment? So whether it was economic justice, whether it was reproductive justice, whether it was uh, immigrant rights, that there was actually a way that we were creating, right, what was what we were hearing from the field. So it wasn't a funder-driven strategy, actually, but that it was recognizing how queer and trans people of color were living their lives in this country and what were the issues that they were working on because because of the reality of their lives. So I think I think it is a, a really good question to ask about are we are we chasing the funding based on the sector, or are we actually thinking about what what's the need? Yeah, just uh, building a little off what Sangeeta was saying. I, um, I mean, I think we're, oh, I think that's just a really good point. I mean, I, it's a good caution uh, for us to be conscious of. You know, in my role, uh, I see I see how health funders are completely ignoring the existence of queer people. So I see part of my job is at least putting it on their their radar screen and bringing it to the conversation. Um, and I. There are, you know, it's fraught with dangers. And medicalization of humans in general, I think, is a challenge. Anytime you go into that health, you know, that very clinical health world. Uh, but I also think there's, you know, my optimistic self would say, well, you know, let's try, let's try strategically to bring all that to the conversation, to talk about, you know, to, to bring the lived experience model, which one would hope would be uh, <laughs> something that health, uh, health funders and leaders could think about. Um, I also want to speak to the, the regionalism question. We, we've been doing a lot of looking at uh, the South uh, in particular. I mean, in general, all, you know, LGBTQ issues are especially underfunded pretty much anywhere outside of New York, California, Washington, D.C. And probably even in D.C. if you're not, if you exclude the, you know, the capital district. Um, so uh, there is, there's a real challenge, and just to throw the stat, we, we figured out that in 2011, about $4 million out of the 125 million went to LGBTQ uh, communities and organizations in the South, which adds up to about $1 uh, per LGBT person uh, living in the South, which is where a third of our population uh, in the US lives. Uh, I think there are a couple of uh, 
of dynamics that are hard to navigate. One is, you know, among uh, funders and various folks with resources, uh, you know, there is the framework of, which has its logic of, uh, you know, where can I get the most bang for my buck? Where, uh, where can I make an investment that will pay off? And what that has led to is putting dollars into campaigns that can win. Um, and what that leads to is not putting dollars into uh, campaigns outside of, you know, in pretty much any campaigns outside of the Northeast or, you know, the West Coast. Uh, so, uh, and the, the positive credit there, though, is that has, I think that, that strategy has run its course. Um, and because we, you know, we sort of have, you know, we definitely have a very divided, in terms of the policy landscape, we have, you know, 20 states where we have some relatively okay policies when it comes to LGBTQ stuff, and then we have 30 where, uh, you know, if you're LGBT, you have no rights recognized by your state. Um, and I have seen a growing interest among funders in thinking about that and in wanting to invest more uh, in places like the South or the Midwest. Uh, so it is a trend I see shifting. The other challenge, frankly, is when you look at the philanthropic community, the, the larger philanthropic community in a place like the South, uh, it is much more conservative in every sense of the word. It, you know, politically conservative uh, and also risk-averse conservative. Um, and there has not been, you know, in a place like New York or even Philadelphia, Local funders have supported their local LGBT organizations, like mainstream local funders have done that. Uh, and that has happened much less often uh, in regions of the South. So part of the work uh, that I think we have to do is educating uh, those funders in those regions and you know, finding ways for them to get entry points uh, to supporting their local LGBT communities and recognizing that that's part of their responsibility too. I'd like to speak to the question, who should fund? Uh, I'm involved with, uh, I'm an AIDS activist. I'm involved with an international campaign. Uh, that campaign is the Robin Hood tax. And uh, I believe, and I'm also an occupier, uh, I believe it's the bankers, it's the corporation, the mega bankers that have robbed us. And I mean, we see what's happening in Washington now, uh, you know, the shutdown. Uh, supposedly there's no money to fund these various programs. Uh, and so uh, I urge people, and I'd like to hear comments also from the panel on that. Uh, uh, we know it's an uphill battle, uh, but I'm quite involved in the Metro, New York City Metro uh, Committee of the Robin Hood uh, Tax. And, and I believe that can fund uh, uh, the AIDS programs, the health programs, uh, whatever programs, that the government is, frankly, is, is backing away with this austerity program. So, um, could I hear some comments on that? Uh, uh, again, it's an uphill battle. We know this, uh, but it's an international picking up momentum in Europe and here in the United States. Hi, uh, my name is Siobhan Mugget. Um, I want to ask a little bit maybe a difficult question that we've kind of talked about or touched on is the uh, competition. There's lots of small organizations really competing with similar and sometimes in fact the same funds. So when we talked to you know, Mario saying about um, you know looking at other people and thinking, God, we're spending that money really poorly. And, you know, and there's these tensions that we're not I'd really love to hear your um, experiences and thoughts on that because alliance building and coalition building is so difficult but the dollars can get in the way and the fight over them can, can get in the way. Um, yeah, and I was thinking about how innovation and policy, for example, have tried to shift their focus now that um, China's being repealed. And my instinct is like, well, the money that they're asking for and getting should be going to organizations that are doing that work already and doing it better. Uh, my name's Richard Burns. And, you know, when we talk about funding, we often talk about foundations. And yet we all know that foundations make up less than 10% of giving in this country. The vast majority of giving is in, from individuals. And yet, in our movement, only a tiny, tiny fraction of LGBT people have ever made a gift to a queer organization. And I think that when we talk about the crisis in funding for LGBT justice movements, the real crisis is that we, as activists and our institutions, have not effectively engaged 
our communities to give to support these efforts. And that, that is really the crisis. If you look at, for example, the environmental movement, that raises much, much more money proportionally from individuals in small gifts across the country. Why can they do it and queer activists cannot? And this has been true for as long as our movement has been around. And there have been numerous recent studies that have come out, some saying that like less than 5% of queer people have ever made a gift to an LGBT movement organization. And so I would be, I mean, that's a frightening statistic to me, but I'd be interested in your thoughts in how can we, as activist leaders, engage our communities more effectively to finance the change that we all would like to see. Can you, can you say a little more about why SBA wanted to partner with USAID? What was the thinking? And that, and then two, given the DC's comment that the rich aren't going to fund it, to fund them, so we need to end capitalism, and then how does this discussion about funding go with the kind of dismantle capitalism? <laughs> saved the lives of my kids. So we are dealing with all the same issues that lots of folks in urban areas are dealing with, except we are not attractive to national funders, including queer funders, because of the um, small scale of the population we're working with. So one of the things I wanted to ask specifically was, how do queer funders specifically queer the work? And what I mean by that is, how do you measure success if success isn't the number of people you're reaching? The life-saving and transformative work we're doing um, have just as big of an impact on the lives of the youth that we're saving and that we're working with to save other youth as people in bigger cities, but because we're in Vermont with the reputation for being this liberal haven, um, we don't get funded, but also because there's 600,000 people in the state of Vermont, so we're not actually seeing that many youth. When we have 5,000 youth, we feel like that's a pretty stellar year for us. Mm -hmm. So what, how are we measuring success? Okay, so uh, I, I want to actually hear more from the rest of the panel and the what is called the advisory pro bono problem, uh, accountability councils, really at the end of the day, both for trans organizations and POC organizations who are asked to advise uh, straight uh, POC organizations, uh, but not be funded to do such work, yeah. or they not even ask to be, to hold those organizations accountable just because they happen to be of the same group as you. And you know, I'll say it, you know, for, I'll put it in the room for Lula for La Casa to receive money to do queer work, which is very necessary, but without asking even local queer Latino groups to advise their work, uh, then where does the accountability go? And furthermore, to advise, to ask those groups to do it for free. So how do you call it the Pennsylvania Latino Council that is now getting money to do work in Latino communities in Pennsylvania when Galae hasn't even been asked to advise that, that council that covers their state um, not even ask to do the, the accountant. So who are they accountable to in doing the queer work? Okay. It's not the queer people themselves who are being affected by that so-called, uh, and I say so-called, uh, ally one, with all the logic implications that come there. Okay, I'm Ray. Um, my question has to do with kind of, um, like one of the things you said before about creating alliances. Um, I was just, I guess last week at um, GMHC on a panel called Trans is Beautiful, and there was three, uh, I mean, it doesn't matter how many, but this uh, one trans woman was saying that um, she wanted to sue GMHC because they're using trans funds for MSM populations. And, um, and like, a lot, like, most of the room was really in support of suing GMHC. Um, and I wanted to know, I guess, what your thoughts are on, you know, <laughs> <laughs> on, on, you know um, yeah, trans people suing gay people. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm going to ask the panelists to do, and I'm not going to rope you kind of, I'm going to go start with you, um, I'm going to go right down the panel, and just kind of comment what you want to, but 
these are kind of your closing remarks, and then we'll end the panel after that. So let me see if I have some of these um, issues. Uh, there's Robin Hood tax, why don't we hold corporations uh, responsible? Uh, there's the uh, competition among organizations. There's the lack of attention to individual giving. There's questions about ending capitalism and uh, how we do that within a funding framework. Um, <laughs> You don't get paid, and sometimes you don't even get asked uh, uh, for things to do. And then there's kind of a, should uh, trans people be doing GMH? <laughs> 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 uh, so, uh, well, I do have the uh, first bracket. <laughs> yes, no, 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 yes. <laughs>
you know, a, a simple thing, I, I would just encourage all of us, especially those who work for more mainstream, either <laughs> queer organizations or mainstream POC organizations, to really advocate for, you know, put that in the grant. You know, if you are uh, La Casa or you're, you're a big local state uh, Latino organization uh, or a state queer organization and you're being asked or encouraged to do POC work, you know, say, you know, we're going to do that, but we really need to have a subcontract of uh, X dollars. Um, and otherwise, we don't, if you don't do that, you know, if you, don't, if you can't give us the larger grant to allow for that, then we're not really getting the resources we need to do this work effectively. Um, and I think that's something, and, and a lot of funders, I mean, funders will be open to that. Um, but it does have to, we have to make that happen, and I know that there are institutions that don't always do that. So any of us who have the influence to, to try to push that conversation and to make that model happen, uh, where all the players are at the table and are getting paid for their participation, I mean, that's just, to, to me, that's the only way it can work. Um, and uh, Vermont, I don't really have a, I, I, I think serving 5,000 youth in a year and changing their lives is an amazing outcome. Um, and I, I think you just need to, I, I don't have any advice other than keep telling you, you made a really good case just now. Um, and I'd be happy to talk more to you about how to make that case and maybe with foundations to, to make that case too. Um, and then in terms of capitalism, uh, you know, I see we, we are working within a capitalist framework. I, part of my role, as I see it in my current position, is to try to divert it, more resources to go toward uh, social justice and toward uh, work that will change the system as much as possible. Um, there is, you know, I do hope that along the way, at, at the very least, will erode capitalism. Um, but I, it, I mean, at some level, it doesn't. You know, the, the revolution will not be funded. Uh, and you know, we, and we don't. You don't need dollars to, to revolt. You can just start revolting, which we're all doing in various ways in our arts and in our worlds. So I would say, let ending capitalism be our next conference. <laughs> why USAID, why Australia. Um, so the money was stated for international human rights anyway. It was going to go out the door regardless of whether we touched it or not. And so the decision was really about did we want to use our expertise and our relationships in the field to help steer that money to places where it could actually do some good, or the other option was that that money was going to go directly to organizations which would place a pretty heavy burden on uh, groups and we actually didn't know which groups those would be and how the relationships would be built and what, the, what that infrastructure would be. And so that was frankly pretty scary. Um, the alternative was pretty scary. So, um, and, and that was just Yeah. Um, and, then I, and then I just want to have a, a, a closing thought about, about our collective responsibility, right? So I think we've been talking a lot about um, what's happening in the field, what's happening in philanthropy, and how those two things are or are not mirroring each other. And, and I've been thinking a lot about um, our collective responsibility and, and what that actually means. And I think it really boils down to whether or not we're asking the right questions. And I think those questions really about what strategies and what communities are our priority, and, and how are we working to meet the needs of these. And, and there are many ways to do that. So I, I just feel like I, I don't want to be close to that. And, and really so with the financial transaction tax, the Robin Hood tax, I really want to highlight that as an amazing opportunity because it's a great and simple proposal, which is just a 1% tax on, or a 1 cent tax on all financial transactions, right? That can generate billions of dollars. Um, it's very doable. And uh, NPA, which is the National Coalition kind of pushing this, is, um, is a really great op vehicle and opportunity to kind of engage in a national economic justice campaign, like make some new friends and really kind of get on board uh, on a moving train. So I definitely kind of want to encourage everyone to check that out. Um, and I think it kind of relates to Andy's question, um, which you actually answered on your own panel, <laughs> which was um, that I just like. <laughs> Not sustaining itself particularly well 
And I, yeah. the answer you gave, which I think is still the one we need to think about, is what, what are we putting in place right now to get ready for, for the next stage of that infrastructural decline? Um, so, and, and in this way, I think that, um, you know, in the short term, I think it means like thinking about things like Medicaid, like the fight for Medicaid as our fight is really crucial. Because as, as the government infrastructure gets whittled down, um, we, we're going to have to really kind of take a stand to change that. Um, but in the longer term, I think it, it actually also means returning back to some very um, updated old school techniques or unconsciousness raising around the economy. Like if there's one thing that I think we can all be, be doing on paid and unpaid basis in our local communities is really getting kind of up to speed on what, what is actually happening with this economy and, and really thinking of ourselves as part of the group of people that need to figure out what comes next. Um, and then I guess I also in the in the framework of being accountable, I wanna I wanna be accountable to the fact that part of my original remarks about kind of the lessons I learned going from organizing to philanthropy was that I was part of a crew of people, which includes Sangeeta and other people, about how to change the conversation within philanthropy to, to make the grassroots work matter. And that's a that's a really difficult process and it's it's ongoing. And so I just want to kind of acknowledge that people are actually trying very hard within philanthropy to figure out how to do that and we need to really support them. And so to kind of tie into the individual funding question, I just want to say I think everyone should just give to a straight. <laughs> important work that's happening locally. And I also want to point out um, the work that Kim Ford did to make a local giving circle. Kim, just the back. Maybe to, uh, giving circles as, as a model for wherever you are in the country for making a vehicle for people to start donating and expanding the circles of people who are donating is, is a great model. Um, and then I think the, the final thing I, I just want to say is that I I really do feel like um, we we can change the game. Like we are at that that moment in in history and in the kind of political process in this country, where I think uh, we can use our imagination. We can use um, unprecedented access to communication with hundreds and thousands of people, and we can use um, kind of our our creativity to figure out how to make uh, this a conversation that we're in the center of. Um, and one of the things I, I really saw uh, as a funder was that there are times, I think, that as organizations, we think about funders as giving us political legitimacy. And I think that one of the most powerful things we can remember is that funders don't actually have the power to do that. Um, that we, we are accountable to each other and we are the ones that kind of make our work legitimate and real and important. Um, so thank you.